This meeting is being recorded. Good evening. Welcome to the Elementary Parent Guardian Forum this evening. Um, thank you for everyone who is participating tonight. And I can see already we have over 300 people who are, are participating in this evening's uh, program. Um, thank you to everyone who submitted questions in the last few days. We've had over 100 questions. and. Um, what we needed to do like we did last week for the secondary form was uh, divide the questions by theme. And the panelists tonight who are, represent uh, administrators and principals in the school system will be addressing each of these themes. We realize that there might be uh, questions that are follow up to some of the presentations and you also may not have had a chance to submit a question. So uh, there, is, there is a function in the Zoom that allows you to write a question and uh, we will address these probably in the last half hour, 20 minutes uh, of this evening. So uh, it is at the bottom of your screen if you would like to um, see that opportunity for asking a question. So let me go to who's here this evening. Um, if we could move the slide. First, let me introduce myself, um, Dr. Kathleen Bodie, Superintendent of Schools. With us this evening is also uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Roderick McNeil, Jr. He will, we have a, um, you might have to scroll down a little bit to see all the people that are here. We have the, the following principals, the Principal Bishop School, Mark McEnany, Brackett, Stephanie Zerchikoff, Dallin, Thad Digman, Hardy, Kate Parrott, Pierce, Karen Hartley, Stratton, Dr. Michael Hanna, Thompson, Karen Donato. Next slide, please. In addition, we have some administrators from the district as well. Uh, we have Sarah Bird, who is the Director of Social Emotional Learning and School Counseling. Allison Elmer, Director of Special Education. We have Dr. Susan Bisson, who is the Director of Digital Learning. And another principal we have is the principal of the Gibbs School, Kristen DeFrancisco. 
And I think that I, uh, and we also have two of our assistant principals at the elementary, Peggy Sasula and Aaron Spinney. I think I have everyone. If I, um, so let me just, uh, again, uh, the format for this evening is that we're going to steam the questions and have an opportunity for different people to address these questions. We had uh, a number of questions on social emotional learning, um, what's going to happen next year, uh, summer. And so we have, a, uh, you will see these questions as we move through tonight's program. Uh, before we begin, though, I want to acknowledge um, what an unprecedented and challenging time this has been for all of us. We've all had to learn how to adjust to new ways of living, uh, working, communicating with each other, meeting. And for our, some of our younger students, this has been challenging uh, with technology. All of our uh, students in kindergarten, uh, first grade, and second grade have been used to uh, working with iPads in school. Um, and now they've been working on Chromebooks and they've also been introduced to Google Classroom in, a, in virtually over the last few weeks. So it's been challenging. And I know that parents, um, this has been a very difficult time for you as you've also been working and trying to also support your, your children in the work that we're um, giving to them and, and trying to engage them in the, the learning that um, I started uh, several weeks ago, but as we, as you know, we've moved into a new phase in the last week in which we are now advancing the curriculum. So without um, more, uh, more uh, comments from me, we're gonna move into some of the questions. Do we have the first uh, slide? All right, so these are some of the district-wide themes that we learned from your questions. There was a lot of questions about asynchronous, synchronous learning, office hours, email. Uh, there was questions about the district PD, including uh, anything with the G Suite app, such as classroom forms, calendar sites, um, tools for video creation and digital resources. The next slide, please. I think we're, we've moved further down the slides. Um, what is, uh, can we go back to the first question in the terms of the themes? Um, all right, well, maybe what I should do at this point, I think that the first question has to do with social emotional learning. Um, and I would ask um, who is going to be speaking to this question to pose the question and begin uh, your response. Great, that would be me. So hello everybody. Uh, we're so happy to have you join us this evening. I know I can speak for my colleagues when I say that uh, we recognize how much of a change this has been for all of us and that we're certainly very appreciative of all the time and energy and effort that has also now been added to the plates of parents during all of this. So um, I, I am happy to be here and we, we are all happy to be here to answer your questions. So I am gonna speak to the first theme which we had noticed in some of the questions, which was how are the schools supporting the social and emotional well-being of our students? And in that uh, I could speak a little bit to what I know is happening at the elementary level with our school social workers. I can certainly know for sure that our social workers are reaching out to our vulnerable students. We know that they are working on securing much needed resources, uh, anything from uh, food, resources in terms of paper, uh, pencils, utilities that students are needing at home. I also know that they are working with families to connect them not only with resources within our schools, but also with resources outside of our schools in terms of uh, connecting with places like Arlington Youth, uh, the Counseling Center, as well as Walker Community Counseling and the Child Mind Institute. I also know that our social workers are working with our grade level teams and joining their class meetings. I know highlights of their day has been able, has been being able to join the class meetings with their colleagues 
I think we, I, we all feel that way. The most important thing that we find that we're doing is connecting with our students and our families. And that certainly brings us the most joy these days. Uh, our social workers are also teaming up with outside providers as well as, as other resources within the building, our EL teachers, our reading interventionists. They are working collaboratively with everyone to make sure that we're supporting our students in that way. Uh, I was recently on a grid for, I think it was an upper grade, and I found a video from a social worker and she was really walking students through some of the mindful activities that we often practice in our schools each day. She was walking them through some mindful breathing techniques and as well as uh, some of the strategies that we use for students when they're feeling overwhelmed and anxious. So I was so happy to see that some of those videos have been put out there for our families to access and our students to access as well. Uh, on the enrichment website through the APS homepage, there's a tab dedicated for parents and for students um, and it has some resources there such as the mental health uh, and online resources and the well-being website which I know has been something that uh, is being accessed as well. Uh, as a parent of two, two boys in school, I certainly feel the pain of so many of you as well. I, I can run a building of 600 people, but yet I can't get my own fifth grader to log on to Dreambox some days. So there, there are definitely challenges that uh, I am right there experiencing with all of you. What I find is most helpful, and I, I think when I'm joining classes or I'm trying to work with our staff on ways to support our students, what I find is most helpful is just meeting the kids where they are and having those conversations with them and trying to work through some of the kinks that we know that they're experiencing and reassuring them that at the end of all this and that they will be okay, we will be okay, and that we are back when we are back together again, whenever that may be, we will certainly meet them where they are and work together to, to move them along on their own continuum. I reiterate that all the time and I know my colleagues do as well that at the end of the day, what matters is that our students feel connected, that they feel as though their teachers are still there for them and that they can still connect with one another. Um, I find also another resource just parent to parent is that I've been scheduling some Zoom calls for my own kids or some hangouts for my own kids to stay connected with their friends. It's, uh, it's certainly a new way of trying to stay connected, but I find even though there's some anxiety around even getting on the class calls. I find once my kids are on them, they are happy and they connect with their teacher and their kids and their friends. Uh, and that's certainly something that I, I know has been a huge asset in our family as well. Um, I know Sarah Bird is also on the call and she may have some additional comments about some of the things that are happening beyond what I've expressed. So Sarah, I'm gonna toss it over to you. See if there's anything you'd like to add. Sure, uh, Karen, thank you, that was beautiful. Yeah, um, I believe that, that Mrs. Donato said so much of what's going on in, in all of our buildings and all of our social workers come with their own um, box of, of tricks and tools and strategies and their, their own backgrounds and trainings. So I do know that as soon as school closed, that was one of the first things that all of our counselors and social workers were doing were identifying students and families who were definitely um, identified with pre-existing you know, mental health conditions and folks who we need to follow up with and aggressively make sure that they have what they need given our current circumstances. But not only that, also following up with um, every single student, kids who are usually thriving and just knowing that in these circumstances with chronic stress that is prolonged, unpredictable and severe, it is uh, an, an adverse childhood experience. It does impact how our brains function, uh, even for the adults. I was saying to a group of staff the other day, who's ordered something ridiculous online and thought back later and said, oh my gosh, that must have been when I was working from my stressed out brain. So uh, working with our staff and really trying to see what we can do to support our kids, um, even you know, if we think they're thriving in this remote learning environment and how can we enrich the kids who need a, a bit more to sink their teeth into and make them feel like they're really being pushed and connected to their community? And then how do we support the kids that are really struggling to log on and feel connected and can't even begin to think about work? So um, just to further on what Karen said, uh, in all of the buildings in the districts now, we have the, the wonderful grids that have come out 
And uh, the benefit to that is that every single student across the district, uh, pre-K through fifth grade, has the same exact social emotional learning lessons and uh, resources being provided to them. I'm sure many of you parents have seen them over the past few weeks, but even the Get Ready to Connect and Learn activities are really conducive to brain science and regulation and how do you work through um, that chronic stress I was talking about using music and movement, nature, breath, all these different great things to get kids moving and in their bodies and working with their, their strengths to then get them ready to connect with their, their peers and their teachers. So playworks, recess, mindfulness, physical activities, the SEL lessons, whether they're open circle, mindful schools, second step, loads of resources available, as Karen mentioned, all of the um, enrichment activities too on the APS website. So there's a lot that's coming out and uh, social workers and counselors are continuing to offer enrichment through social thinking, zones of regulation, um, and all of the tools of the mind for the kindergartners and for all the other programs that are, are out there. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, both of you. Um, we've started with this, this area, this theme of questions, because we feel so strongly as a district that this is the most important thing that we can be doing right now is supporting our students as they move through uh, this experience. And we know that there's a lot of challenges with it, um, but the, the connection to uh, their teachers, their fellow students, their families are, is, is paramount during this time. As we move into the more academic, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. McNeil if he would just give a, a, a brief overview of our um, remote learning plan as it has evolved. We're in our third phase of this school closure, and then we'll be moving into some other specific questions that have been asked uh, over the last few days. Thank you. Uh, Dr. McNeil? Thank you, uh, Dr. Bodie. Can, um, can we have the first slide that's entitled district-wide themes? Uh, can we go back to that slide to begin with? So I do wanna uh, comment on some of the major highlights of the uh, district-wide remote uh, learning plan as we move into this next phase. Uh, so we are moving forward in the curriculum as recommended by the state. And uh, the goal uh, for the remote learning plan at this particular point in time is to focus on specific key understandings that were not covered uh, throughout the year up until March 13th. And the key understandings that we have selected um, to, to which we're aligning our uh, lessons are those uh, specific key understandings that are critical to move students to the next uh, level in their learning. Also in, uh, in alignment with the state, we're using asynchronous videos created by teachers and our coaches uh, throughout the district to focus on direct instruction. So those videos and the reason why we're using the asynchronous video format is uh, so, that, so that there's a focus on equity. Uh, we want to make sure that we are providing uh, various videos that students can access at their own convenience, because we know that uh, the different situations in each one of the households of our families is different. So we want to make sure that we're honoring that those differences and uh, supplying the direct instruction to support our lessons that uh, students can uh, access at any time throughout the day. The synchronous video formats, we are highly encouraging our instructional staff, uh, teachers, and other support personnel to make at least two contacts with uh, students throughout the week. Uh, and we're enc highly encouraging that one of those contacts is a synchronous uh, live video session. Uh, and the focus for those synchronous live video sessions is to uh, connect with students. And as uh, Ms. Bird and uh, Ms. Donato spoke about the making sure that we're uh, focusing on the social and emotional well-being of our students. So we are encouraging our staff to do that through the synchronous videos at least once a week. Uh, we're also encouraging staff to hold office hours uh, and to make sure that they're uh, replying or responding to students and parents uh, using email uh, 
in real time. So we know we understand that some of our students, especially in the upper grades, might have questions about the assignments that they've been given. And we're asking teachers to please make sure that they're checking their emails twice a day. And, and quite often our teachers are checking, are checking their emails more than that, but we're, we're making sure that they're understanding that they have to respond to students and families in real time. Uh, so the office hours are there for uh, students to connect with their teachers uh, so they can ask questions about the assignments. And those are also uh, scheduled throughout the week. So we're trying to put together a comprehensive plan so that uh, teachers and support personnel can maintain consistent contact with our students. I'm going to uh, now ask Dr. Susan Bisson to talk about the various uh, professional development that we're offering to our staff, because we do realize at this particular point in time in our remote learning plan and because of the situation that we're in with the distance learning that we have had to have a focus on technology and providing uh, various uh, ways to support our instructional staff uh, with the knowledge and the uh, resources that will allow us to um, connect with our students uh, in a digital format. Okay, so we have the next slide, please. Well, so we can stay on this if, if Dr. Bissick can go Actually, ahead. Actually, right. could, could we advance to slide seven? Oh. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, hello, everyone. I, I will apologize in advance if my dog begins barking. She's very vigilant about anyone who approaches the house, even, even if they're not very close. Um, so first, uh, before I describe, um, if we could advance to the next slide, before I describe um, what we're doing um, in terms of supporting our teachers and staff in the district, I just like to say the word resilience uh, comes to mind when I think of this, these many weeks now that we've been in school closure. Um, our group, which consists of the digital learning specialists at the elementary, middle and high school, the digital learning teachers who are in each of the school buildings, our librarians at the elementary and high school level, uh, as well as our assistive technology specialist who has, um, it has been part of our group as well. Um, we have really learned an incredible amount and I feel like everyone really should be recognized for the amazing job they've done. As I'm sure all of you know from trying to manage remote learning at home, there is a lot to it. Uh, oftentimes the technology doesn't do exactly what we think it will do. And we are getting constant feedback. We're incorporating that feedback into our professional development. Um, we're creating new professional development for people based on trying to make sure teachers and staff have strategies for using uh, particularly Google Classroom and Google Meet. So uh, with that said, we have focused on our core G Suite apps, which include Classroom, Meet, which is also sometimes referred as Hangouts or Hangouts Meet. Uh, Google has had a name change recently. Google Form, Forms, Calendar, and Sites. Uh, we're also focused on tools for creation, video creation, and we're including uh, digital resources for collaboration and a couple of examples of that are Jamboard and Padlet. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. And just to give you a sense of how many people, sorry, the, the next, the uh, two slides up, um, it says digital literacy professional development. Um, there, here is just, some numbers for you to look at in terms of how many people we have had participating since the end of March in our digital literacy workshops, our professional development. Um, it is uh, quite astounding, uh, the numbers, and we are continuing to run sessions, multiple sessions weekly, uh, and will continue to do so until we switch toward the end of May into really planning for whatever may come our way in in the fall. Thank you.
Talk, talk to me. I just pick this up? Uh, so if we go to the slideshow, we can advance the slide. If you could put the slideshow back up, and then we can move on to the next theme that does uh, conclude my comments on the asynchronous and synchronous uh, learning. And then uh, Dr. Bisson just finished talking about the uh, professional development. So here we are. Uh, we talked about the SEL, so we can go to the next slide. This is, um, well, I think that we wanted to also talk a little bit about the advantages a little bit more, because that question was certainly asked uh, several times, several more than several times in the question and answer. And I don't know if Dr. Uh, Hannah wanted to speak to that a little bit more. Well, about the advantage of asynchronous uh, yeah. learning. Okay. I would, yeah, thank you so much, um, Dr. McNeil, Dr. Bodie, and, and everyone for showing up. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm Michael Hanna, principal at Stratton Elementary. Uh, there's a, a lot of unexpected uh, kind of uh, silver linings, I guess, that, that we might be able to find in this really challenging time and being able to get some face time with other schools, principals and families. I hope we all can see that that's, uh, that's one of those in this meeting tonight. Um, so I've been asked to speak a little bit just from a leadership perspective about the different advantages of both synchronous and asynchronous uh, learning from children, either designed or led by teachers. Um, to start, just the methods of asynchronous remote learning, this can be uh, self-guided lessons um, designed by the teacher teams, uh, streaming video content of either the teacher or another expert. Uh, slide presentations, voiceover content, there's virtual and digital books, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, there's posted uh, elements to classroom, there's all those asynchronous exchanges across discussion boards. I, th I think we all have a, a notion of all the things that we've been designing asynchronously. And, and as Dr. McNeil mentioned, the advantages of this method uh, include the flexibility, uh, the pacing and the equity of access. Um, Asynchronous content allows for the maximum flexibility across the wide range of family circumstances. And I just want to pause on that for a moment and remark on how much the diversity, <clears throat> excuse me again, of our families has come to the foreground for all of us working in schools uh, these days. I've realized myself that the, the common experience of a common schoolhouse is a really enormous unifier um, and that we started the school year with one environment for 458 children uh, and now we have 458 environments for 458 children. So regarding the synchronous meeting uh, with teachers and their students, um, we make sure that this happens once a week uh, and many classrooms try to do it more. Uh, but we notice that each family is challenged differently with having this happen. Um, and we're really beginning to be able to make some generalizations about how the children in each grade level are challenged uh, developmentally in doing this. So as any of you present when these hangouts happen can verify, um, but generally speaking, the younger children K to two, uh, it's both working with the technology, but also the unique executive functioning skills it takes to make a hangout effective and not just frustrating. Um, and then for older students, it's the challenge to a lot of times convince them to regularly uh, engage and participate. So uh, just as a final note on the synchronous learning, um, as practitioners, we've realized something that probably should have been obvious, uh, but we're really learning it now that to run a classroom all day long requires a, just a huge set of verbal and nonverbal teacher moves that just can't be replicated online uh, perfectly. Um, although we are continuing to stretch our skill set growth and see what new teacher moves we need to respond to the unique challenges of, of synchronous learning. And we'll continue to over the next five and a half weeks to get more uh, of those synchronous meetings going uh, where we can find room for, for families um, to engage them. So thank you very much for for allowing me to speak to that topic from a leadership perspective.
I'm sorry, I pushed the wrong button. Um, can you, you can hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, another thing that came up in the questions that we received uh, was a question about connectedness. In fact, there's two, two questions. Um, and the first of these is, what does communication with students and staff look like and sound during the week? Thank you, Dr. Bodhi. I've been um, asked to speak to this one as well. Um, it kind of obviously connects to the idea of, of synchronous learning versus asynchronous learning. And um, and I, I just want to, you know, in talking about what it is that students and staff are doing uh, during the week, during the day, I just want to start off by saying a, a little bit of my own perspective. And I just think it's relevant to mention that I teach and have a leadership position with a couple of universities ed leadership programs. So I've been able to connect with principals from around the Commonwealth on the topic of programming during um, remote learning. And I have to say there is a unique level of really high quality programming that's happening in Arlington during this time. And there's some areas that I wanna highlight about that. Um, the first is a just, a, I think a unique level of collaboration happening among all elementary schools the leadership, the faculty, and including a, a strong collaboration with uh, the Arlington Education Association. Um, I've seen over these two months that all of the meetings, emails, texts, uh, late and into the weekend, sharing of resources has really helped to maintain not only great programming, but a really high morale that's really essential for that programming to, to, to be impactful. Uh, the learning plan, I don't know if many people know this, but the learning plan for each grade across the district that's distributed to families on Sunday night, this represents an enormous amount of expert design work and really skillful leadership from Dr. Bodie and Dr. McNeil to corral all of the various stakeholders uh, to get that together. They've designed a framework where there's representation from every school in every discipline in every grade to design each grid to be launched on Tuesday and then fleshed out and fought over uh, until it's launched on Sunday. And this is all happening while, uh, you know, the, the, um, the whole thing is being individualized for every unique learning need in the district, special education, ELL, reading intervention, math. And I just want to say again, this is all being done by teachers and students who have never used Google Classroom as a teaching environment before eight weeks ago. So the breadth and the depth of the learning tasks are really closely aligned with the, the curriculum that happens during a regular school year. Um, and again, it's all happening thanks to faculty who've never taught through recorded video ever before. Um, and I just wanna say that as a principal, we are in Google Classrooms every day, including Hangouts uh, and the following week design meetings. We're really proud of the level uh, that the faculty are doing everything they can to make this time as enriching as possible for the children. Um, and I just wanna say one last thing, that all this design work is happening while the instructional week is happening at the same time. So we're anticipating the next week while doing this week. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that there's as strong an effort as possible to have as timely response to parents as we can um, the, and this happens on and off Google Classroom, um, but I know my principal colleagues and I would, would request that you reach out to your child's principal if any time you feel like there's any kind of communication disconnect with teachers, but we would um, also ask, of course, that you remember that a large majority of our teachers have family and child demands that are uh, exactly the same as, as, as what uh, you're all facing as well. Um, so uh, thank you very much for a, a moment to talk a bit about, um, yeah, what, what communication with students and staff looks and sounds like during the week. Thank you very much. And, and I do have to commend everyone. The, the effort, the team effort across the whole district has been rather exceptional. Um, we have another question that's come forward in different ways, and that is professional development. Are staff receiving professional development with technology? And I think that this question has already been sort of, uh, asked and answered, um, but I don't know if there's any principal who would like to add any comments to this. 
So professional development that may be posing, that been challenging for teachers. All right. Oh, I, I can, I can, oh, go ahead, Mark. Uh, I, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, you know, it's, I, I just want to um, say good evening. It's Mark McEnany from the Bishop Elementary School. Um, I need to give a big shout out to the IT department, uh, Dr. Bisson and her crew for being so responsive uh, with the professional development needs that have, um, that have risen uh, up uh, as it relates to the, re the remote learning environment that we find ourselves in. Um, but it, and it's not only Susan and uh, her team that are providing the professional development. We have uh, digital uh, learning liaisons at each uh, elementary school who are doing a fabulous job connecting with staff and, um, in the, the uh, individual buildings. Uh, we also have people that um, are just more uh, confident with uh, technology and they're, they're shoring uh, the others up. Um, we're we're uh, working really hard to connect with those individuals who uh, might not be as comfortable with technology. And it's really exciting uh, to see uh, a staff member kind of step up and say, oh, I know how to do this. And, you know, during a faculty meeting when we do share outs as far as just exposing one another to the different platforms and, um, and, and technology that's out there for our use to make our use um, easier, uh, more efficient and um, uh, user friendly, uh, depending on the age. And so, you know, um, everyone has come together to uh, help each other out. And um, I, I, I thank uh, Dr. Bisson and her team for help leading the charge and empowering others to kind of take the leads within their schools to make professional development happen. And it, it comes daily. Uh, we, we face different issues and uh, desires to use uh, different platforms and there's always someone to lean on. So uh, the professional development and the way that it's been structured um, has been um, kind of a, a, a triage at the beginning. And now we can become more proactive as we look at professional development um, you know, as we look at, you know, a potential extension of our remote learning experience, um, you know, with uh, the fall being uncertain. So uh, great job, Dr. Bisson. And uh, if any of you all at home have any questions regarding technology, I would recommend starting with uh, the principals. Uh, we might be able to answer uh, what, you, uh, what you have. And if not, we'll uh, be able to push that to Dr. Bisson. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McEnany. All right, we're on slide nine now. And another theme that came up in the uh, questions, what it's about student support. Uh, what does support look like to students who receive specialized instruction? What is in place for our English language learners? And that would be uh, my section of the presentation this evening. Thank you, Dr. Bodhi. My name is Kate Peretz. I'm the principal at Hardy Elementary School. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Looking at the numbers of participants on my screen is telling me 476. It's, it's a dedicated group. Um, and I want to say before I, I start um, that we really do appreciate all of the feedback and all of the questions that you have shared with us. I think that this is you know, certainly a difficult process and uh, going through this, the collaborative um, efforts that have gone on behind the scenes with all of our different departments have been really incredible, but your feedback is helpful because we are constantly working to evolve and perfect our programming as we go um, for our students. And I think uh, one of the reasons why I think it's important that we say that is that we do consider in special education um, and in all of our different ways in which we support students, that we are teams and that families certainly are members of those teams. Um, a lot of the questions that we got this evening were around um, issues of special education. Um, however, there are many, many ways that students are supported and um, several of them have been mentioned already uh, within math, within reading. Um, I'll talk a little bit about English language learners in a moment, but we also have, um, in addition to special education, uh, collaborations and supports through our METCO program, through AYCC and other social emotional supports um, that were mentioned earlier when we talked about SEL. Um, 
But so the question of how special education students are being serviced at the moment is that our students with IEPs uh, have been receiving um, remote learning from special educators and have for um, many weeks been receiving those services. Uh, our special educators work to create remote learning plans and those are in place and special educators are meeting with students um, as well as related service providers. Uh, those learning opportunities in special education are consistent with the offerings of the general education um, population and plans, and they focus on essential standards and skills. Um, and our special education students are working through those IEPs towards very specific goals. Um, it, it, this is a big this is a big thing, right? It it means a lot to get those supports. Um, and those plans are uh, critically important. And so if you have any questions and concerns about that, um, and many of the questions that we received were very specific to individual students, uh, we really would like you to reach out to your uh, teachers, special education liaisons and um, our special education coordinator coordinators at the elementary level. Um, now, Having said that, one of the questions had to do with assessments. So during this time, evaluations while school is not in session are not continuing. Um, and some people asked some questions about the kinds of assessments that could happen uh, through this remote environment. And since the closure, some standardized test um, publishers have released some protocols for remote testing. However, we do have concerns over the validity of these measures. And so that is something that we would take very seriously to consider before we put that into place. Um, again, it becomes a very case-by-case -case basis um, when we make those decisions about how to proceed. So you should ask those questions of your school and certainly your uh, building principal is a good resource in that way. Um, moving forward, I think it's really important to know that this is a time of uncertainty for us as well. There were questions that you asked about um, extended school year, summer services, um, and the supports that are in place for programs like Title I. Um, this is undecided. I mean, at this time, you know, we're waiting for uh, our governor's decisions. Um, there are decisions that need to be made about lifting this current stay at home order. And so we are awaiting that guidance from the state in order to help us with those decisions. Um, but hopefully, hopefully they'll be made soon. I know we're all waiting for that. Um, but the, the short answer to that question is if those orders are lifted and we can put those plans into place that students on IEPs, if it is on their IEP, will be entitled to those services. Um, I think that moving forward, um, we should think about making sure that everyone understands, however, that there are, there are many ways to be connected and supported within the schools. And if during the school year, you were someone who received supports from a particular service provider, that that should continue. Um, and I'd like to, to read something um, that was shared with me about um, English learner education. Uh, and this department continues to work in partnerships with families to find ways to support students that will differ from traditional classroom interactions. The ELE department continues to focus on the holistic needs of our learners and families, one by maintaining connections between school staff and students and families, and two, providing equitable access to all remote learning activities, and three, promoting the safety and well being of students and our families. During this time of school closure, the EL teachers have developed a remote learning EL schedule that allows for the continued support of language development for our ELLs and in all grade levels. EL teachers are also providing language development support to their specific individual ELE groups. Our EL teachers continue to reach out to our families for the social emotional needs of our students and families checking in about interpreting and translating translation services and requests, as well as providing connections to resources needed for our families. Nothing can replace the in-person schooling experience. So please reach out for any support that is needed for your child and or your family. Please do not hesitate to ask us for support. Um, and I think just in um, 
closing at this time, I really would like to say that there are many, many ways for children to get support within our school systems. And these hangouts and these times to have connection are happening with many educators. So don't forget about that PE and health teacher. Don't forget about that music or that art teacher or that uh, paraprofessional in the library. Those Google Classrooms exist there for your connection and support as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ferris. Um, so you, we're going, the last theme, uh, well, actually it's one of the last themes, was student progress. Uh, will there be progress reports in June and will my child be retained? And I believe Mr. Digman. That's me. That's Good evening, you. everybody. Thad Digman, Dallin Elementary. Thanks for being here with us tonight. I think that's a question that um, has come up quite a bit, both uh, practically and from a place of um, concern and worry. Um, and I, I want to, before I, you know, read a prepared statement just about this because I want to make sure that um, it's clear and well understood. I do want to make sure that everybody knows um, how much we appreciate the efforts that parents are putting in right now to partner with our teachers, um, particularly for our elementary age students. The level of independence that they're able to have is dramatically and drastically different than students in the secondary. Um, coupled with you know, this increase in the amount of technology um, and digital literacy that we're asking from our students. It's a really big job. Um, and uh, I, I know I greatly appreciate it. So, so what we've heard from our families is that students who are doing really well in this current model of home learning require abundant resources and parental support. We also know that this is not a universal condition for all families and students. And so with this in mind, we are not going to be issuing traditional progress reports at the end of the final school trimester. trimester. So we've heard from many families that they're still sharing devices, they're struggling with access. We have siblings that are taking care of each other um, and providing a child care um, that's needed while adults are working. We know we have many families that are limited by the languages that are spoken at home, and there's countless other barriers that are the result of this coronavirus school closure. So we also know that from the science of learning, uh, um, the brains and stress uh, negatively impact cognition and performance. So put simply, many students are not learning under the optimal conditions that a caring classroom community provides. So grades right now cannot accurately represent what our students have learned and would be impossibly incomplete for many, many, many children right now. So we're currently looking at options to provide families with information about this phase of remote learning that began on May 4th. So this will include an overview of the essential standards and the content that has been introduced in each grade level so that our families are aware and have access to that. Um, we will also develop a way for our families to access the asynchronous lessons and the content that's been developed by our teachers and cur curriculum teams. Uh, this will allow families who have expressed a desire to revisit content or to explore content that they weren't able to get to simply because of the circumstances and schedules at home, the option to do so um, in, uh, in a way that works for them. And although I will say that as, uh, as educators of young children, you know, and, and many of us parents of young children, we encourage our families to choose the emotional wellness of their children as your continued priority. Um, so a related question that has come up is around placement and retention. So as a district, we're aligning with guidance from the state to not retain students related to this, uh, to their progress during the school closure. Instead, we're going to plan uh, the necessary curriculum changes in each grade level with continued guidance from the state. Um, so we expect this to include more direction on essential standards across all levels in our district. And this will need to be reflected in our curriculum mapping. Uh, also related are questions around assessment, end of year and start of year assessment particularly with beginning of the year assessment. Um, thankfully, this is a pretty common practice in all our elementary schools. We're all, we always uh, have a plan to look at our students' reading and math profiles, for example. Um, and we know that the early curriculum work in each grade level informs our teachers about their students as learners, helps us create likability groups across subject areas. Um, and then I would say also as a district, um, the this year and going forward, we've been actively revising our assessment plans um, by each grade level to better form our instruction. This is something that's represented in our district goals and would, would continue on even if we hadn't been in 
on this particular moment in time. You know, and I think our students are also fortunate and our staff to work in a district that values coaching. Uh, we have coaches in all our schools to support instruction, curriculum implementation. We have interventionists that are there to support a range of students in the classroom and out, learning specialists in each of our school um, who share their expertise and are there for children um, at risk, um, and paraprofessionals who play a critical role in supporting the classroom and um, providing teachers the opportunity to work in small group settings, even within classrooms um, with more children. So, uh, you know, I think we all can uh, very much uh, relate to the concern around the uh, progress that's being made right now. And I just wanna circle back and remind us uh, all to um, be aware that we're, uh, we are not able at this point to really equitably provide that optimal environment for all kids. And we certainly do not wanna hold this against our students. This, is, you know, this obviously has um, nothing to do with their willingness to, um, to participate in time, well, to some degree. Rod, and I don't know, Dr. McNeil, if you wanna to add to that at all. get my mute button. No, I think you covered it uh, in a very comprehensive manner, so I don't have anything else to add. All right. So if we move on to the last, the, there were a lot of questions um, about summer plans in the district and what what would we expect for a physical reentry in the fall? As we, let me, let me take the question of school, uh, summer school this summer or all of our other programs that we have and, and we have many. We have summer fun, which we have now over a thousand registrations for. We have our, uh, some special education programs during the summer. We also have camp uh, and all of these programs are waiting to find out whether we would um, be able to have some physical presence to have these camp and these other programs. At the moment, it does not appear that that is probably going to be the case. Uh, we are, we will look and see over the next couple of weeks and have uh, some uh, firm uh, plans and, and messages about this. But at the moment, we are we are planning an alternative way of looking at this, which would be in a virtual environment. And uh, we will be back in touch with more information about this. Um, but I, I, we don't see right now um, the possibility of, be, of having, for example, the summer fun and students coming into uh, the Addison Middle School for some of the programming. So the, so the community education department is working on some virtual alternatives. We will, for those, for those families that would be, uh, their child would be in a special education program this summer, you, the department will be in touch with you as well over the next few weeks. So right now we're planning for more of a virtual environment for the summer. Um, perhaps that will change and uh, we'll know more probably by the end of May to have definite plans. If we go to the question about next year, and I, I think maybe this might have been the question that was asked the most often, is what will happen next year? And the, the, the answer is we don't know really quite yet. There are a lot of uh, daunting uh, hurdles to have, and we're certainly doing a lot of discussing and planning. We will have committees within the, within the district at different levels to plan for what next year could look like. I mean, there's, for those of you that are entering, uh, having entering kindergarten students, this year we would have had screenings done in June. Those will be deferred to the fall. There are, you know, there's. It's a it's a topic that we're talking about. We're talking about that also at the um, the daily emergency leadership management team meetings, as to what that could possibly be. So I know that we're all anxious to have some certainty about this, but at this time, we don't know. Um, it's going to depend a, a lot on, on guidance from our governor in terms of what kind of uh, physical uh, contact we have 
we were to maintain six feet in social distancing, we would have to think about a different kind of day than we have now because there is no room in a classroom to maintain that for the number of students that are there. So there are a, a lot of very practical things that we have to consider and also how to make the environment uh, safe, uh, both for parents to feel good about sending their child to school and for our staff to feel safe in that environment as well. So what I can tell you at this point is that there is much discussion that is going on about this and they'll be planning and as we, we probably will have uh, another form later, um, if not the end of probably early June sometime to have some more discussion, uh, answer questions when we have a little more certainty about what next year could look like. So I can see uh, from the Q&A, we have up to 45 questions that have already been submitted. And uh, uh, Dr. McNeil is going to be reading the questions. Some of them may be uh, sort of duplicates too, uh, or themes. And um, I would ask uh, those of you that are here, if you would like to take that question or Dr. McNeil uh, direct the question to someone that would be very, that'd be helpful. Thank you. Do you want to do you want to begin with the uh, the question, Doctor? Yes. Brody, if if oh, you wanted ahead. to, just like we did in the secondary forum, I'm also happy to speak to the the social emotional concerns because I know a lot of the questions about returning in the fall um, result really came around not just the logistics but also just how do we I, how do I prepare mm -hmm. my child mm -hmm. for return um, and myself. So just wanted to let folks. Why don't you talk about that right now? Yeah, so just to dovetail what, what you were just speaking about, um, absolutely many, many of you all mentioned that this is a, a big concern um, along with the previous questions about academics. And so we just wanted to reassure you all that as Dr. Bodhi mentioned, yes, we're waiting to hear a lot of information um, in terms of the Department of Public Health and so on. However, regardless of what the physicality is and the logistics are, we can assure you that the, the underpinning caring for the social emotional health and well-being of the students of the families that are sending the students and of the staff that are responsible for creating the safe spaces for them is going to be there regardless of what the logistics are and we have been hard at work ensuring that those plans are in place long before logistics ever hit the ground running so we can't ever be in a place thinking about how to make spaces work if people are not yet feeling safe about what that would entail. We've partnered with a lot of really great organizations. They're putting out wonderful um, wonderful guidance on how to go about doing that. And Arlington has a really um, long history of partnering with Leslie University and building trauma-sensitive schools, training over 100 staff members on how to build those practices and bring them into their classrooms. So we are hard at work making sure that that happens. As um, we move along, you will be sure to hear from us because in broad strokes, the first few steps are listening sessions to hear from families, to hear from students, to hear from our own staff as well. What do you all need to make sure that when you come back, this is really a safe and supportive learning environment? As uh, Mr. Digman said, you know, when we are not feeling safe, we are not learning and we're not working at our best capacity. And so we need to make sure that we've secured that safety, not just from the physical, plant side of things, but also from the, the mental place of it. Otherwise, our brains aren't ready to learn. So I just wanted to reassure folks that we are hard at work on that, and we will be in touch with you sooner rather than later in terms of our next steps. Um, and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. McNeil, do you want to begin with some of the questions? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Bodie. Uh, so the first question, so I just want to uh, let all of our participants know that the way that the questions are divided up uh, in the Q&A is we have open questions. Those are, those are questions that are that have not received a written response. Um, and then we have the answered questions. And so uh, participants have written questions into the, um, into the platform. And then as we have been uh, progressing through our discussion, our, our panelists have been taking on some of those questions and answering them uh, in written form. So the first open question that has not been answered, it comes from Mary Beth Wilkes. 
And uh, the question is, my question is especially pertinent for the rising sixth graders. What are APS's plans for building community and connection for this cohort? What plans do you have to mitigate anxiety when school resumes at a new, uh, at a new to them school? And so I'm gonna direct this question to uh, Kristen, who is, our, who is the current principal of the Gibb School. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. I had a feeling you were gonna direct that question toward me. You know it was coming. <laughs> I knew it was coming. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Kristen DeFrancisco. I am currently the principal of the sixth grade Gibbs School. Uh, and before I begin and answer that question, I, you don't know how much it means to, be, to, be, to me to be included in this company this evening. Um, I have worked very closely with all of these administrators when I was the principal at Hardy and feel very uh, blessed that Kate is taking over there and Peggy is, is you know, holding, you know, holding up the, holding up the ships, steering that ship. Um, I can tell you that, that in the secondary level, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, I mean that, I mean that sincerely. You, you are very lucky to have this group of people working with your children. They are trying to figure out how they transition kids from K all the way up to five. It is, it is quite a feat to be able to do it. And so to be able to be here tonight and speak with them um, really is an honor for me. There's, so, I'm sure so many fifth grade uh, families sitting out there listening right now. And I'm going to assure you that the transition to Gibbs will be wonderful. Uh, your kids are in for a treat. This, this school has been uh, you know, such a wonderful gift to Arlington, I think having a sixth grade only school where uh, we can focus on what kids are, are going through during the sixth grade transition has just been great. Um, I'm pleased with how these first two years have gone and I know the third year is gonna be just as wonderful. So what do we have in place? You know, I've been thinking a lot about the foundations we put in place in Arlington and I'm gonna to speak toward that social emotional piece just like Sarah just did and many of my colleagues did because that's going to be what's really important in these first four weeks of school as your sixth graders come up to Gibbs. Typically what we do is I go around and I visit all the elementary schools. Well, I only got to four before we had to um, you know, shut down or, or COVID kind of interfered with progress there. But here's what we are going to do instead. So we will be setting up a forum for parents. As a matter of fact, you probably already have the information out in an email from me about that. So next Wednesday evening, same time, same channel, it's going to be um, on the 20th. It will be at seven o'clock. Um, Wendy Salvatore, uh, who's the assistant principal at Gibbs and myself, we will, we've put together a panel of people to answer some questions. You should have gotten a survey today out uh, through email that you can, you know, similar to, to the, the survey you probably filled out for this evening, you can answer, ask some questions. Um, that we'll be ready to answer. We've got uh, um, some teachers that are gonna join us. We have some curriculum directors that are going to join us. And this would take the place of an in-person forum, which is something we have run every single year. Um, so we're prepared to do that and we're looking forward to doing that. Um, we are also working on some really great videos that are coming out to kids. So those videos are gonna be tours of the building. It's going to be um, some guest stars from the exploratory learning community, which is art and music and PE and facts and digital media literacy and all of those new things that kids get to take. Well, their teachers are actually putting together some videos right now that will help um, kids put, put names and faces together and, and sort of get to meet them virtually, which, which we're really looking forward to do, doing. Um, in addition to that, we've got some sixth graders on board who are willing to do some videos for us. And, and talk a little bit to, to the incoming fifth graders about, about what it's going to be like. Uh, Gibbs is set up so nicely for this one when they do arrive in the fall because we have a, a fully functioning operational advisory curriculum. And our advisory, which is so important under normal circumstances, is gonna be even more important now as we're, as we're moving kids back into school that have you know, had a break from this traditional learning, what we call traditional learning. So, our, our staff right now is getting that curriculum ready to go. We're taking what we have, we're tweaking it a little bit. Sarah Bird has been working uh, with our, our faculty. She comes to our meetings. We've got some really nice choice boards for our current sixth graders, which I know will be morphing into some really great choice boards for our fifth graders. Um, so rest assured, I know it, it's a scary transition without COVID. 
um, coming in to, to kind of add a little bit of, of another layer to it. But I am very confident that your fifth graders are going to feel welcome. They're going to feel excited about the transition. Um, they are going to enjoy being meeting all of the kids from the seven elementary schools. Um, Gibbs was built on innovation, and we're certainly not going to stop innovating now. So we will, we will have our, a handle on this for sure. I look forward to seeing many of you, or, or at least talking to you virtually, <laughs> next week on Wednesday. Rod? Thank you very much, Kristen. So the next question, uh, and please forgive me if I don't uh, say your name correctly, your last name, but it's Lilia Benchetrit. And I think Dr. Bodie, this question could uh, this be a question for you. Uh, why isn't there more being done to have active Zoom classes every day, such as done regularly in other school districts, such as New Hampshire and New York, and in the private schools? Well, this might actually, I, I can answer it, um, but if there's more detail, we can actually ask uh, uh, Susan Dixon. Mm -hmm. We have looked at this issue from the very beginning um, because actually some of our teachers had begun using Zoom. Um, our concern with Zoom has been its uh, privacy. They have been working on that uh, ever, for quite a while and is improving. We know that that's improving, but so has this, the, uh, the platform that we are using as part of our, our Google Suite, which is the Hangout Meet. Uh, some of the features in the that Zoom had initially that we that now exist in, in the Google Hangout is, for example, the grid. So everyone can see each other. That was that is now part of uh, Hangout. But there's another issue that still hasn't been resolved, and there are um, there are technical issues in terms of malware that we're aware of. So yes, I understand some school districts have moved into the, the use of Zoom. We are, we are using Zoom this evening and, and with, with uh, teachers in the district, we both use Zoom and, and Hangout. Um, meetings are outside the district. We're, we're using different kinds of platforms, WebEx, Zoom, um, and, and, and there's one other one, I'm trying to think of the name of it. But with students, we would want to err on the side of caution we also want to have some uniformity in the district. And since the Hangout, which is part of our learning suite, is available and has the sufficient functions that we need, we're, we've decided just to stay with that, uh, with that platform. And I would ask um, uh, Dr. Bisson if you would want to add anything to that. Uh, no, Dr. Modi, I, I think you uh, said it well. Um, you know, the security issues are a real concern, um, not only in our district, but I know other districts as well. Um, so, uh, and Google Meet is within our Spy Ponders or available to students in our Spy Ponders domain and um, is, is an easier app for students to engage with. Uh, currently. Thank you. Could I speak to this a little bit, Dr. Bodie? Absolutely. Um, thanks very much. Yeah, we, we definitely uh, uh, gave a, um, a good vetting of, of Zoom, and I know that some districts and some places have elected to, to use that platform, but I, I wonder if maybe some of the question is actually not um, totally about the platform, but just about the, the frequency of, of um, synchronous learning. Um, and there is certainly an argument to be made for doing more of that. The research bears out that there's some real upside and value for doing synchronous learning. Um, we are following direction uh, both from the state and also uh, aligning with our um, neighboring districts and having a priority on asynchronous direct instruction from children's teachers uh, for all the reasons that we mentioned. Um, again, uh, we are continuing to add synchronous opportunities as much as we can. Um, but in order to ensure uh, sort of an equitable experience and having that as a priority um, is really what's driving this. And, and, you know, reasonable people can have a disagreement with that, I'm sure. But uh, we have really thrown our weight behind designing uh, learning that is aligned with our curriculum um, and it 
it the I am curious about really long sessions of synchronous teaching and learning uh, between teachers and students and how the quality endures and something like that. Um, it, as I mentioned in my brief remarks before, uh, we're noticing that children have a significant challenge in remaining engaged in synchronous learning uh, events. And uh, to simply do more, I don't think would get them more engaged or more um, uh, make that a more effective platform necessarily. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hanna. So the next question uh, is for uh, Dr. Bisson and, and maybe uh, principals can also chime in as it relates to managing student behavior during the asynchronous video. So this one comes from Flynn Monks. Do you have suggestions on how to keep younger kids engaged in watching the asynchronous videos or slideshows? Both parents in my first grader's house work full time and it's very difficult to get him to watch instructional videos without supervision. He also has a hard time staying focused watching them and tends to run away and pout when we ask him to watch them. Understandably, there, there are nowhere near as engaging as a real classroom and also I think make it all the more present for him that he's not in the normal school environment which brings up all sorts of negative emotions. So I'm gonna ask um, uh, maybe a principal, do you want to respond to this? I'd be happy to answer that one. Okay. Um, so I, I feel like there is absolutely no question that this is challenging for many of our students and our families, therefore after that and it, that having that um, ability to work with a teacher is something that feels like um, it would be important in that moment and I think that the connection with the teacher is still there even in this environment even if they're not the ones who are delivering that instruction and so when I have been talking to families about these kinds of challenges the kinds of thing questions that I've been asking are you know, what is it that's working for your child during this time? Let's pinpoint those highlights of what's happening that's, that's positive. And let's see if we can draw that out and connect the child and engage the child back into the learning in those ways. And that classroom teachers, you know, are more than happy to talk about what those things are and try to be accommodating to those needs during this time. Um, so I, I really don't think that people should be afraid to reach out to a classroom teacher and to say, you know, these are the kinds of issues that we're having and um, have those conversations about how can we draw the child back in to engage them in this learning. Because it's clear that, that the plans are not always going to work for everybody all of the time. And I don't think any of us are, are you know, functioning in this place in which we think that, it, that that's true, that that's going to happen. So we need to continue to engage with each other in this process in order to help individual children to connect back to the learning. So it, it, it's tricky. It's hard to say this is what you need to do when your child wants to hide under the table and not you know, pay attention to a reading lesson, but that there are people at school who can talk you through that and can connect with your child on that and see if we can bring them back in. Uh, help them set learning goals for the week and help them pick things that are um, engaging for them to help them, you know, be able to build their comfort level with the learning that's happening um, at home for school. Can I, can I just add one thing to that, Kate? And that I, I agree completely. Um, I, I would say, first of all, it would be remiss not to mention it just when I read a question like this, it reminds me what a special place school is. In particular, reminds me it, of um, how much of learning K through two is experiential and collaborative and social. Um, so this transition and trying to bait students into using more um, screen time to get their content is really hard. I think it's something that families are grappling with and I, and I know that our educational team is grappling with this as well. But just um, if it's helpful for Flynn and if it's helpful for other families, I think one of the benefits of having um, our weekly learning plans with uh, asynchronous content is the ability to be flexible and work with your child's schedule. So um, I've talked with many families who their strategy is, 
They know when um, those times in the day that their students are more active or willing to engage. And so they're able to um, introduce those less appealing uh, subject areas. Um, sometimes it's reading, sometimes it's writing, sometimes it's other stuff. Um, so uh, I would say, you know, one piece of advice would be to work with your child um, uh, and, and try to think about timing. The second thing is I think this is going to take time. Uh, uh, providing a structure for the kids' day that's predictable is something that, um, you know, for, for schools is a, a, a part of what we do right from the start. You know, we're providing kids with a really consistent, reliable routine, visual schedules, um, transitions, movement breaks. Um, and of course, that's a really big expectation. It's hard to put on our parents. Um, you know, this is something our teachers are trained to do and have um, experience practicing and working with all sorts of different students. But providing some type of consistency and structure in their routine um, can also be a, a benefit for kids. And it may take time. I think patience is incredibly important um, for everybody and self-compassion and compassion for, compassion for the children. And then I would just end by saying, you know, the, your teachers uh, have a lot of institutional knowledge, at least from September of um, 2019 about what works and what doesn't work. And I think those emails and reaching out and just um, mining them for information is, all, is always a great idea. The, uh, the questions keep increasing. Uh, we're going to only have about 15 more minutes. So mm -hmm. um, maybe we can get through more of them. Uh, Dr. McNeil, can you uh, yes. um, find, them, find some that haven't been answered in different ways? Yes, I am looking for some ones because a, a lot of them are, that I'm reading right now go to the theme of plans for next fall. Uh, Dr. Hannah talked about the, uh, the, the recommendation for two uh, contacts a week and at least one being a synchronous video. Um, Here's one that has not been asked, uh, and this goes probably to you, Dr. Bodhi. Can, uh, so this comes from Georgina Prager. Uh, can parents get access to some of the curriculum resources so we can help our kids focus on the intended principles for the assignments? And I know that we're following recommendations from the state and uh, the Board of Health, so I don't think we're going to be uh, offering uh, uh, opening up the building for parents to come in. So I don't know if you want to comment on that, Dr. Bodie. I'm not sure I interpreted the question as getting the resources. Uh, yes, it's getting some of the curriculum resources. And I will state that uh, in the grids, there are links to various resources, enrichment activities uh, that are shared in the grids. So if parents want to open those uh, links up, there are curriculum resources that are shared in the grid, so I can comment on that. I don't know if many other principals want to follow up with that, so but. Can yeah. I, can I that, um, a second? If I interpreted the question, um, if there's materials at the school that they would want, that their child had left in their desk mm -hmm. and want those materials, um, that is going to have to wait. Uh, at this point, uh, we do. We have, as you know, distributed many Chromebooks, and we've had a pickup outside uh, the school to do that. But we are looking at a plan because we have lockers and we have desks that need to be cleared out. But I'm not sure that's what the intent of the question was. Um, one thing I want to re repeat that uh, Mr. Digman mentioned is that these grids are very rich and there's a lot of time spent on them. We're going to make them available beyond the school year so that there are other resources. Um, I, I guess I would like more clarity on what resources we're, we're talking about, but maybe somebody else has a different um, interpretation. Dr. Bodie, I think that maybe it was, um, I think that maybe families were wondering about uh, resources that could ramp them up uh, in as quick a way as possible around the essential learning targets and, yeah. you know, instructional methods, things like that. So um, some kind of crash course in Turk math or, or, or yeah. Coffin, uh, uh, but there, but there, are links, there are links in the uh, grid that do offer those type of uh, resources. And there are lessons straight from Turk math for the, for instance, for the, uh, 
to the math curriculum that our uh, parents want to uh, click on those links, they will have access to the to resources that are utilized in order to plan the instruction. If, we're, if, we're, if I'm interpreting that question to mean uh, for them to have those type of resources available to them. Uh, Mr. Uh, Thad, did you want to add on to that? Yeah, I, I guess just one thing, because I think it circles back to um, the question um, that I, we spoke to about progress reports and things like that. Um, I think it is really important for parents to have a sense of the essential standards that were included um, in the um, weekly learning plans that started post May 4th. And so we will make sure that families have access to that. And then like you just mentioned, Dr. McNeil, um, ensuring that there are um, th those grids that have been created weekly. You know, we've heard from many parents who, you know, are uh, letting us know that they are you know, they're making decisions maybe to focus on certain areas and just having to let some areas of um, some content areas go um, because of the conditions in their home. And so should those families want to go back and either spiral back or um, eventually introduce that content, we can want to give um, folks a chance. Um, the, um, the other piece of this, I think, just to speak to maybe an idea of like handing over like our, our teaching guides or our curriculum resources, I, I just want to you know, remind everybody that um, our teachers not only are trained in the pedagogy, but we have coaching and professional development and many hours of, of that that we've um, dedicated to ensuring that those curriculum resources are implemented in the most impacting way possible. So just to hand them over, I think may uh, would be incomplete and maybe even um, uh, you know, inadvertently problematic in some ways. So. Um, we know that our curriculum scope and sequence are going to need to be adjusted for our students um, because this is, um, e even though we are moving forward incrementally, it's not the optimal environment for our students. Um, and that will be the work, the big work of teachers and administrators and curriculum directors and special educators to ensure that when our, we're able to get back to school that we're providing, um, we're, we're meeting them as close to where we left off as possible. Okay. Um. Here's a question that has not been asked. Will we be able to use the Chromebooks over the summer? Um, we're talking about that being a, a, a possibility. In fact, probably a probability. I know that uh, the library would like uh, students to be able to have access uh, to, to a device over the summer for the kind of programming uh, that they want to offer to students this summer. Um, so we, we will make a, a final decision on that, but I think that is a high probability that we will, we will do that. Okay, uh, there's another question for, I think maybe Dr. Bisson can answer this uh, about uh, when, uh, and there's a couple of questions, so I'm gonna uh, put them together for a theme. So it seems that there's a few questions about uh, when students submit work for feedback, how are parents uh, supposed to view the feedback? And I think that's through Google Classroom. So did you wanna talk about that? Yes, so um, the students can log in and see feedback in Google Classroom. Um, we have recommended that teachers make families aware, and we've done this through professional development, uh, set some sort of a schedule or, or let families know when feedback might be there for students. Um, because as you know, we do, students do not have email in the elementary grades. So currently um, that, is, that is what is in place. Uh, if, you're, if you need to check in with your child's teacher to understand how their uh, planning on giving feedback, please do. Okay. Uh, do we have time for a couple more questions? Uh, and this one is probably for Allison Elmer, uh, Director of Special Education, for students who are undergoing testing for additional supports and for which that testing is not now moving forward until in-person school resumes. Are there any supports that could be made available? Thank you, Rod. So um, I answered a similar question in the um, chat box for another family. Um, as uh, Ms. Perez explained during this um, 
we have to consider individually whether we can assess a child um, through remote means. Um, for many reasons, it's unlikely we'll be able to, but we will be making those individual considerations um, on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, your school teams are still meeting, um, and so I would encourage folks who aren't currently um, eligible for special education services to reach out to their building principals to connect about any additional resources that um, can be provided uh, to support students. Uh, I know we still have student support teams who are convening at the building level, um, so I would encourage folks to reach out there. If you do have an active special ed consent out there, please contact your special ed team chairperson for additional follow-up. Okay, and we have a question from uh, Shira Wolf. Uh, this is new. When will students know the names of their future teachers next year? Is this process of mixing, mixing children up going to continue as usual, just like a regular end of the year uh, would, or will this be different because of COVID-19? So does the elementary principal want to address this question? Anyone want to address yes. that sure. about uh, transitioning sure. for next year uh, and when those yeah. types okay. of that information? Yes, yes, absolutely. Sorry, uh, we are definitely starting that placement process now. Um, and there's a lot about the placement process that will stay, you know, exactly as the same as it would be if we were in school. Um, obviously, with a, with a new consideration for the times. Um, but I think that when we think about placement for our students, we think about so many different things into the next school year. Um, so that there's, there's a short answer to that question, and then there's a longer, much more complicated answer to that question. Because obviously, this time of school closure and living through a pandemic is going to make things feel different in a lot of ways. And we're gonna to have to put another level of um, understanding into our placement process. But in any given year, uh, we look at the data that we have for our children. And fortunately, we do have a great deal of data um, that we collected up until March um, 13th, um, and that our teachers do know our children very well. Um, and that we will be using that um, in addition to you know, really thinking about not just the academic piece, but the social emotional piece um, and other basic kind of pieces of information about kids, about um, special education plans, about 504s, about EL needs, and all of those things will help to create balanced classrooms. Um, so I think that there's not really a, a, like a short answer. Yes, we're just gonna keep everybody the same in the classrooms, and I've heard people say that quite a lot, actually, why don't we just keep these classrooms the same and roll them over into the next year? Um, but I think it's really not a process that is that simple. Um, so we are starting it now. Um, if you haven't heard from your building principal yet, you probably will really soon, um, looking for some input from you, um, and that you'll be hearing much more about the process as the, as the weeks roll on. And so I'm going to. Um, we have probably there's, there's, time for one more. One then, more. Yes. And um, then we'll talk yeah. about the ones that haven't been answered yet. Yes. Um, people want to know uh, how we're going to address that. So we're up to 107 open questions. Um, so we have a few. Again, another theme. So, uh, Dr. Bodie, do you want to talk about the different ways that we could open up in the fall? Uh, because parents are still asking about what are the possibilities that we're considering and what would it look like, uh, especially in light of the fact that we haven't heard any, we are, we've yet to hear direction from the governor. I don't know if you want to reiterate what you said earlier. Well, there have been many things that people have talked about. That you have to go to the fundamentals, though, of um, how do you make ensure that students are safe, staff are safe, how do you maintain social distancing? How do you, um, if, if taking temperatures is one of the one of the ways that you um, monitor students coming into school, how is that practically done? For example, even if you went into staggered sessions where it A B schedule half one day, half another, or or split sessions, take for Audison for example with 900 students. 
how do you monitor in the morning uh, taking the temperature of 450 uh, students as they come through the door socially distanced. So there are a lot of practical things that we have to take into consideration. Um, but certainly there have been, you know, anywhere from what we're currently doing, but maybe with a, a different um, level of synchronicity next year, we could have uh, split sessions, uh, A-B sessions. There could be just be, be a delayed opening. Honestly, we're looking at all of these possibilities, but we don't know the answer yet. And I go back to what are the, the conditions that would have to be in place in order for us to open. And I think some of those are guided by the governor, by the Department of Education, and the Department of Public Health as well. Okay, and then I think that we need to address one question, uh, if we can, this will be the final one about uh, kindergartens and incoming kindergartners uh, for the fall, because there was a few questions about how we're going to uh, intake those kindergartners uh, in light of the situation. Yes, um, we had some discussion about that uh, among the elementary principals as to we had different options. Um, one, one of the things that we do is we have a parent meeting in, in and usually in May, and then we have a chance for the student to come and meet the teachers at the at their school. And then there's a process of going through um, the screening process. Uh, and none of those are happening. But on the other hand, we can create again some kind of virtual introduction to the kindergarten, which we will be planning. Uh, we 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 already know that we have quite a quite a large entering kindergarten class. Uh, but some parts of it will have to be uh, deferred until the fall. And again, that would be part of our planning because if we're not starting physically in the building, how is that going to work with our kindergarten students? But, I, but we will have a, a session uh, this spring or early June, it's sort of the same kind of time frame we normally have it, in which we have a, just an evening for kindergarten parents in which we can talk about the kindergarten experience and um, the, um, the process of transiting from preschool to kindergarten. Okay. Um, I don't know if we want to close. It is now 834. So did yeah. you want to close with some closing remarks and then talk about how we're going to respond to the questions and get those responses out to the public? Um, we will take a, well, first of all, thank you very much. The number of people that ha has, has gone down actually since we first started, we're down um, to, uh, to in the 300s versus up in the 400s. So thank you very much for being with us this evening. And uh, I think the very fact that so many people are, um, are have turned out to participate this evening says there's a, there's a real need for having more opportunities that you can have questions answered and connect with um, teachers and administrators in the district. And we will be planning more of these as we go forward. As far as the questions that came in this evening, uh, there's quite a few of them. We may have to take some time to sort of get back and sort of create a theme around questions that haven't been answered. Uh, but at, we, will, we will do that and probably have it part of the uh, Q&A that's on the district website right now for parents but you know, indicate what were the questions from this evening that were not answered. Again, thank you very much. And, and most importantly, uh, thank you for partnering with us during this very difficult and challenging time. Um, I hope that this evening you have a much better insight into the kind of the, the thinking, the planning that's been going on in our district. So I wish you good health uh, for you and your family as we move forward and, uh, and tell you that we continue to appreciate working with all of you. Thank you. And thank you to all the panelists this evening um, for being here and we'll look forward to another opportunity like this. Thank you very much. Good night. The recording has stopped.